I think we're all wrong about Loki. We have misjudged him. Loki's introduction to the series has been, well, it's giving mixed messages. Is he a hero? Is he a bad guy? How do we make sense of some of the very conflicting things that we have been presented about this character? Well, I'm gonna try solve this mystery, so please help me out. The few pieces of information that we were given about Prince Loki prior to chapter 1130 made it seem like Loki was actually quite a good guy. I know silhouettes can be pretty misleading in One Piece. Loki is just the latest example of a goofy silhouette turning out to be quite the awesome or quite the ferocious figure. But one key detail that I think, or at least I had always thought, something that I thought was quite symbolic was Loki with a flower. For me, this seemed to indicate that Loki was a good guy. He's innocent, he's of a sweet, kind nature. You know, as if he's a hopeless romantic. He fell in love with Charlotte Lola at first sight and proposed to her despite the fact that she was the daughter of Elbaf's one of most hated, hated enemies. And that to me suggested that he was capable of putting behind a decades old grudge for the sake of love. When Big Mom tried to pass off Lola's identical twin, Chiffon, as his new bride, Loki saw through the plot, he knew the difference, and that to me, well that to me suggested multiple things. He's not some Machiavellian who, like Big Mom, was just using this marriage as some sort of political ploy. He wasn't just trying to find a way in to gain control of Big Mom's fearsome Yonko crew. He also wasn't superficially into Lola. He loved her for who she was and not just her looks. And then the fact that the Elbafians, alongside Loki, they were also willing to bury the hatchet, get over their long-held hatred for Big Mom, despite what she did to their home, despite what she did to their hero. Well, I thought that really indicated that the Elbafians truly loved and revered and respected their prince. You know, they respected him enough to honor his decision to marry one of Big Mom's daughters. And when her trick involving the twin sisters were revealed, they were rightfully very angry at Big Mom. You know, they got angry on behalf of Loki. And this response isn't something that you would expect from a country that saw Loki as their big shame. This isn't the sort of response, it's not the sort of support you would expect from a people, from a citizen or a group of citizens that saw Loki as this great evil that needs to be contained. Whereas, the introduction that we actually get to Loki in chapter 1130, well that completely turns everything I thought I knew about Loki on its head. Loki is considered Elbaf's shame. He's been sentenced to crucifixion. Now, of course, this ordeal involving Big Mom and Lola happened quite a number of years ago. We don't have an exact date, but we do know that Lola arrived at Thriller Bark five years ago after running away from her home. But even before then, we know that she had been traveling for some time with her crew. She'd gone around the Grand Line, even made her way to Fishman Island. And also, if we look at the farewell panel between Lola and Pudding, it seems like Pudding is around 10 years old here, perhaps even younger. And so if she's 16 years old now, I would estimate that these events involving Loki and Lola's failed engagement, their failed marriage, I would say that happened around 6 to 10 years ago. And so what this tells us then is that up until this point, up to the point of Loki and Lola's engagement, Prince Loki was, for all intents and purposes, he was a well-liked and revered prince. He wasn't considered Elbaf's shame back then. And whatever has happened, what's occurred to shift Elbaf's perception of him, that's happened in the more recent years. Which then led me to think, well, how recent? And again, let's work this through together. So it seems to me that Loki's supposed murder of his own father, King Harold, that's something that happened in the last couple of years. They explain that it's something that happened when Dory and Brogy were away, and that isn't super helpful because they've been gone for over a century. And it's not quite clear when Oimo and Kashi brought them back to Elbaf, but it must have only been in the last year or so, potentially even in the last few months, because in the cover story series from the decks all around the world, and this is a cover story series that took place following the time skip, we saw that Dory and Brogy were still at Little Garden, still continuing their 100 year duel. So then let's try to use some of the other information that we have. One of the key reveals, I think, from chapter 1130 is that Hadridin, he is 
also a prince. He seems to be Prince Loki's older brother. And that really led me to think because if Hadrudin was allowed to go and form the new giant warrior pirates, you would assume that he was only allowed to do so because the Elbaf kingdom trusted in their other prince, aka Loki. They trusted Loki to take on the role of the prince of Elbaf while his older brother, the firstborn, supposed firstborn, was allowed to roam free because Prince Loki would remain at home, he would remain in the kingdom, ruling or at least learning how to rule at the castle. And this is a bit of an assumption without knowing all that much about Elbafian politics, you know, without knowing much of their royal customs. But I think it makes sense, right? Because King Harold, he doesn't seem to have been part of the giant warrior pirates. And I would assume that that's not because he's not strong enough to be. You know, for a kingdom of warriors, you would have to assume that their king also has to be strong. So it's just more likely that he wasn't sailing around the seas. He wasn't freely going around traveling with the pirates because his role is back at the castle. His role is as king to rule. And then so you would think that if he had an heir, that heir would also most likely not be allowed to go and roam the seas because that prince's role would also be to undergo some royal training, you know, royal tutelage to take on and be primed to be the next king. And again, because we don't know much about Elbafian royal customs, while I can't say for sure that the title of royalty would pass down one family line, you know, maybe you could even argue that as a nation of warriors, the giants would actually have to battle and fight so that they could claim the title of king. But if we look at the term Elbaf royal line that was actually used in chapter 1130, I would say that that's referring to one family line. And then so I would say that either one of King Harold's sons would have been considered the next royal heir. And then that has me thinking, well, it's pretty customary, usually. It's pretty customary for the firstborn or the older one to be considered next in line. So then why would Hadrudun, the older of the two, be allowed to go sail the seas and go become a pirate? And so interestingly enough, if you actually go back and if you look, if you go back to see the way that Elbafians refer to Hadrudin or the way that they treat him, you wouldn't even be able to tell that he's a royal. Which is fair enough because we only did find out in chapter 1130 that he is in fact of royal heritage. And I would argue that there really wasn't many clues to suggest that he was royal at all. In chapter 866, other children, children, feel comfortable calling him the wild child. That's not a very respectful term. In chapter 1130, the older giants, they call him a brat. Again, not very respectful towards your prince. And yeah, maybe you could say that's just part of the giant warrior culture. You know, royals, they're not babied. They're not treated with as much respect or reverence. You know, the whole Elbafian culture and custom, it's more brutal, more egalitarian. I don't know, less pompous, less pretentious. But when you take everything into account, I just can't help but think that Hadrudin was passed over when it came to becoming the next king. The fact that Hadrudin is a prince doesn't seem to be common knowledge outside of Elbaf. You know, Big Mom sought to solidify her political power through Prince Loki, the seemingly official prince. When Hadrudin is introduced much earlier in the series, we're never told that he's a prince. It never comes up during the interactions with the buggy's delivery. And so what it seems to me, at least, is that it seems that King Harold and I guess Elbaf, they looked to Loki to become the next king. And again, that begs the question, why? And if we choose to forget the more recent information from chapter 1130 for the time being, I think it's because that of these two heirs, Loki was actually the more even-tempered, the nicer, the more benevolent prince. Like I said at the beginning of today's discussion, everything we've been shown up until chapter 1130 suggested that Loki is actually a good guy. 
sky. Hydradin is the wild, tempestuous prince. Whereas Loki, he's the sweet and loving prince. So then what happened? What changed? Why is Loki all above shame now? Now I have a few theories, but before I share my thoughts, I would really, really appreciate it if you guys could click the subscribe button. I'm on a mission to reach 100k subscribers and I need your help doing so. You can also take this time now to like the video and also leave your comments below on what you think happened to Loki or on who you really think Loki is inside. Okay, so like I said, I have a few ideas. The first one centers around Oda's focus on Rodo. This fake sun god was probably a most unexpected surprise for our entry into the Elbaf arc. And Rodo is obviously actually quite an important character. I have to admit that I actually completely forgot this guy existed. Whereas now I think he is super important and that Oda had always meant for him to be quite important. And you know why I think that? It's because Oda actually introduced him alongside Loki. In chapter 866, we find out that Loki and Rodo were actually born in the same year. And so was Goldberg for that matter. But it seems that Oda is clearly playing on some parallel characterization for these two figures. They are two supposed sun gods of Elbaf. Their names were brought up right alongside each other all the way back in Big Mom's flashback. They're both considered Elbaf shame. In chapter 1130, Gerd actually comments that Loki isn't the shame of Elbaf, or at least in her opinion, Loki isn't the shame of Elbaf, Rodo is. And after reading the entire chapter, I thought those were some pretty strong words. Loki killed your king. This is a guy that murdered his own father and murdered your royal sovereign. You're going to equate Rodo being on that same level just because you find him creepy, because you find him weird? Look, I might be reading way too much into this, but I think that piece of dialogue actually points to much more. That there's something weird going on between Loki and Rodo. There's a reason why Oda has decided to make them sort of mirror each other. Obviously not in terms of design because, you know, Loki looks sick. And look, I just haven't fully fleshed it out yet, but I think it could have something to do with like a mistaken identity, maybe some sort of misunderstanding of some sort. Maybe you guys can help me flesh it out. But for the time being, we're going to move on to my second idea. And this idea is actually based on another curious piece of dialogue. The fact that Loki is also known as the Accursed Prince. This is actually a very important detail, and we know it must be an important detail because it's actually the title of chapter 1130. And we have to unpack this further because I think that being called the Accursed Prince is quite different to being considered Elbaf Shame. That second nickname, Elbaf Shame, that's been given to Loki because of his supposed active actions in getting up to no good. Whereas on the other hand, being called Cursed, that suggests something being done to you. That suggests a level of passivity, perhaps even a level of sympathy. And this name, this epithet, seems to be something that Loki has been known for for quite some time. I would say it most likely predates to his actions of murdering King Harold. And I think it's actually also very significant because when I did some digging, it seems that there is a real life mythological figure who is often called the Accursed Prince. And this figure also just so happens to be importantly related to the Norse god Loki. And this is the story of Prince Baldur, one of Odin's sons. So Prince Baldur is said to have been a favorite amongst all the gods. He was known to have been of a good and righteous nature. Baldur is also most well known for not having been able to physically feel anything. Nothing in the world except for mistletoe could affect him, could hurt him. This was due to a spell that was cast by his mother. But this spell that was supposedly supposed to protect him, that ironically, that tragically turned out to be a curse. Reason being because the trickster god Loki, he used this to his advantage and tricked Baldur's own brother to shoot him with mistletoe, eventually killing Baldur the accursed prince. And Baldur's death would be one of the catalysts for the Ragnarok, the great war that's going to 
bring about the end of the Norse world. And immediately, I think we can all agree that there are some similarities or connections that we can make to the series from this Norse tale. But here's how I'm choosing to interpret this real life inspiration. I think Oda has chosen to amalgamate these multiple Norse figures into his creation of his Loki. I think that Loki is made up of both Baldur, the cursed but good prince, the prince who was favoured by all, as well as the original Norse god Loki, the trickster god, the evil one, the god of a very duplicitous nature. And this is my idea of Oda's conception for his Loki. Loki was by nature a very good, a very virtuous prince by birth. He was therefore the favoured one and the king as well as the kingdom supported him in becoming the next heir. And again, this seems to be supported supported by all accounts that we've received of Loki up until chapter 1130. However, he was also cursed, and I don't think the curse referred to him killing his father, although potentially it might have, or at least been related to it. I think the curse was probably laid on him much earlier, and I think it's interesting that we have this idea of a curse, because curse or this existence seems to also be very closely related to the idea of fate. And fate is also a very important concept in Norse mythology as well as in One Piece. And I actually have an entire video discussing key Norse mythological concepts and figures and how they relate to Elbaf or the entire One Piece series. I go through concepts like fate, like the Ragnarok, Yggdrasil, the world tree, all of it. So I highly recommend you go and watch that video. But from chapter 1130, it seems like there is this idea of fate, or at least prophecies, that is present in Elbaf. The giant warriors seem to almost prophesy that when Loki is unleashed into the world, he is going to cause havoc. He's going to cause and bring the world to ruin. Loki himself says that he's the one that's going to bring the world to an end. And I think that that is actually what the curse entails. Loki has been cursed to be the harbinger of the world's doom. And when you think about it, that sounds to be awfully similar to another prophecy that we've heard about another sun god. Wouldn't you say that Luffy also being prophesized to bring about the ruin of Fishman Island sounds very similar? Similar. And we all know that Luffy isn't evil. And in fact, don't we actually want this world to come to an end? Isn't that Luffy's whole role and whole point as the sun god Nika to bring about the new dawn? You know, we at least want the current world system to come to an end. This current world system ruled by Imu, propped up by the world government, a world government that hides the truth of its political system, keeps its citizens in the dark ages, goes around killing an entire population, culling entire islands on a whim. We want this world to come to an end. Isn't that why we're all excited or at least expecting Luffy to actually unleash Loki? Unleash Loki and start the Ragnarok because we want that great war and we want to bring about a new dawn. But I think we still have to resolve one last puzzle and that is Loki's murder of his father. Because, you know, no matter which way you look at it, that does seem evil. If Loki murdered his father, that's pretty cold-blooded. I don't know how you go about justifying that, but this is manga, anime after all. Everyone can be redeemed. So let's unpack Loki's supposed murder of his own father, the late King Harold. So this seems to be Loki's unforgivable, evil act, the one that has resulted in him being called Elbaf Shame as well as justifying his crucifixion. And it's said that the reason why Loki killed his father was to inherit this legendary devil fruit that has been passed down his family, the royal family, for generations. Except here lies a contradiction or multiple contradictions. The first is that depending on which way you look at it, this seems to go against what we have known about devil fruits, or at least adds a new layer, is a little off about what we've known of devil fruits. If King Harold was the owner and the user of this legendary devil fruit, how does killing him, how would that automatically result in Loki coming in possession of that devil fruit? You know, that doesn't seem to work with what we currently know of how devil fruit generation works, which is that when someone who is a devil fruit user dies, that devil fruit will regenerate and maybe the devil fruit will regenerate close by as we have seen in previous cases, but it reappears somewhere else and it's not like a 
fixed time or place because it seems to just transform another nearby fruit. So then maybe that actually means that Harold didn't possess the devil fruit power. He wasn't the devil fruit user. Maybe he just, you know, maybe he just had the devil fruit in his possession. In which case, a second contradiction. Why would Loki have needed to kill his father for the devil fruit? We already know that that fruit gets passed down the royal family through generations. By his birthright, especially if he was the next heir, Loki would have eventually inherited that legendary devil fruit. Was Loki just really that impatient and did he decide that he needed that fruit then and there? Did he need the fruit at a particular moment in time? And if so, why? And so when I started thinking about this, well then I can't help but think that maybe it goes back to that prophecy. Maybe Loki knew that he had to gain the powers of that legendary devil fruit in order to fulfill his prophecy, in order to fulfill his curse, his destiny, his fate. If he's going to bring about the end of the world as the almighty sun god, he needs a legendary devil fruit power to do so. And here's the thing about fate and destiny in Norse mythology, it can't be undone. They always come true. Now, this doesn't mean they are 100% determinative and gets rid of free will. Like I said, I do go into the concept of fate in Norse mythology in that other video. But for example, a reason why a prophecy might not be 100% determinative is that it might tell you what will happen, how it will happen, but it might not tell you when something will happen. For example, Ragnarok. Ragnarok is actually an event that hasn't occurred in Norse mythology yet, but it is prophesized to occur. And so we all know that it will 100% occur, but we don't know when. And a lot of Norse mythology, a lot of Odin's actions in particular, the Norse god or father Odin's actions, is to try delay or is to try prevent actions that will bring about Ragnarok from occurring. But if we then apply this to One Piece, if we apply this to Loki, because fate, because prophecies are always known to come true, I think this might mean that maybe King Harold was even aware, was always aware that Prince Loki would eventually kill him one day. Maybe he even accepted this fact, maybe he welcomed or allowed Loki to do so. He didn't bear Loki any ill will for realizing and fulfilling his prophecy because it was an event that they all knew would eventually occur almost outside of Loki's control. I mean, this is the brutal world of giant warriors after all. One of the first things that we ever found out about Elbaf was this no-nonsense, tough and violent but honorable way of living, a giant warrior's code that they lived by. And this is exactly how Dory and Brogi were introduced. They're in this hundred-year-old death match just to settle a question of honor or of strength of bravery and this is actually how Dory explains it in my village we lived by a code when there's a dispute and neither side will yield the god of Elbaf decides the matter our god protects the one who is right and lets him live whoever is right will win the battle and live. And so reading this explanation, maybe this is actually what happened instead. Maybe Loki and Harold didn't see eye to eye about Loki's prophecy, about his place and his role in the world. Loki knew that he was prophesized, that he was destined to bring about the end of the world. This is something that he saw as having to happen, needing to happen. And he knew that in order for him to fulfill this prophecy, that he would need this legendary devil fruit. Whereas King Harold, the king disagreed. Maybe he saw this prophecy, maybe he saw it as the curse. It's a curse that needed to be prevented, it needed to be fought and resisted at all costs. And so this meant that Harold refused to pass down his legendary devil fruit, the one that has been getting passed down through all the generations of Elbafian kings, because he didn't want Loki to be that person who is going to bring the world's downfall. He didn't want that for his son. And so this is a conflict that neither side would yield from, and so instead the father and son 
can engage in a battle, they decide that they will allow the god of Elbaf to decide who is right. And we know how it goes. Loki is the one that prevails, killing his father in the process, taking the devil fruit for himself. But maybe the fact that this was actually an honorable battle, that Loki righteously won as per the laws, as per the rules and customs of the Elbafian code, maybe that wasn't common knowledge to Elbafians. They don't see it as this honorable battle, and instead the kingdom just sees it as a bloody act of murder. Hence why Loki has been tied up, he has been chained, he's been sentenced to crucifixion, and this all is a big misunderstanding. Now those are just some of my ideas. Essentially that Loki is one part of a prophecy that has resulted in him being misjudged mischaracterized, falsely sentenced to death, whereas he's actually just playing his role in an important world event that has to occur. Another key detail that I think relates to all of this is the giant sword at Elbaf. I can't help but think that this is awfully similar to the giant sword that we saw back at Onigashima. That sword was never explained by the end of the Wano arc, not to mention that Onigashima is actually shaped like a giant skull, complete with, you know, the horns that they all wear. And not to mention that Wano itself is also very closely related to another similar prophecy, one about the coming of a new dawn. Anyways, I think these connections probably require more thinking, more discussing in a video of its own, so we'll save it for a next time, as well as a discussion on what will Loki's legendary devil fruit be? Well, you can let me know your thoughts by leaving a comment below. If you've enjoyed today's discussion, please do like the video. Again, please do subscribe. I would really, really appreciate it. If you'd like to support the channel further, you can become like these wonderful people and become a channel member. But as always, I really appreciate you coming here to listen to my discussions and help me figure some of these crazy One Piece questions out. This has been Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.